I'm Doug Clinton, co-founder and partner at Deepwater Asset Management, and this is the Deload Podcast, where I talk to founders and builders building frontier technology companies that change how we live. Today, I talk with Ramses Alcade. He's the CEO and founder of Neurable. Neurable is a portfolio company for Deepwater. It's actually one of the first investments we ever made. And Neurable creates brain-computer interfaces, which we refer to as BCI in the episode. BCIs allow computers to understand signals coming from the brain, and some BCIs actually even let computers send signal back to the brain. On the episode, Ramses and I talk about Neurable's upcoming MW75 Neuro headset launch, how BCI can help people perform and focus better, and even how BCI can improve our experiences with consumer AI products. Here is the episode. All right, Ramses, thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to talk to you about everything you guys are doing at Neurable. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long journey, but we're really starting to hit a big stride right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the long journey, I go back to uh, 2016, I think it was, when we first met you. You were uh, in your lab in Michigan, and I remember uh, my partner Gene and I, we came out to see you, and you had um, one of the people on your team was controlling, I think it was Jeff, he was controlling a remote control car with this crazy looking EEG headset with his brainwaves. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So, I mean, that's whatever, seven years ago now, and we're just getting ready for you to kind of bring that to market, which is super exciting. I know you just had a great CES. You won a ton of awards, best of CES from Rolling Stone. Um, so to your point, it's been a long journey. So let's talk about the journey first and maybe just start with kind of what is the vision for Neurable? Why did you start the company and what do you want to do? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the vision of the company is how do we make neurotechnology accessible? You know, right now we have so many incredible solutions in neuroscience uh, that are just not reachable with the way that current technology, the, the way neurotechnology works right now. Just to give you an example, I have a friend of mine who is working with the uh, University of Columbia, and they have this technology that can detect Alzheimer's 10 years before you get it, which is amazing, right? We have to go to this lab once a month and for five minutes wear this cap with gel on your head. And the thing is, no matter how incredible the technology is, no one's going to do that. Like no one goes to a lab every single month for five minutes to check if 10 years from now they're going to get Alzheimer's. It just, it doesn't happen. Right. And so, but what if you could bring that to an everyday device, like a, a pair of headphones or earbuds that you already wear every single day. Uh, and so that was the, 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 the mission of the company essentially. And, and it really started out in, in 2011 as part of my PhD work where we created a technology that could increase the signal to noise of brain data. And back then what we could do is take what would traditionally be a 128 sensor system and bring it down to the cap that you were using, uh, which had gel everywhere and like, you know, goop going down people's faces, but still get the same performance metrics as these larger cap systems. And since then we've been evolving the technology to go to smaller and smaller form factors to go from wet electro gel caps to dry and now finally bringing them down to headphones and earbuds while still retaining all that same rich data so that you can still build tools, applications, and science on top of these devices. And that product you mentioned, headphones, is something that is really close to coming to market. Yeah, definitely. So what we do is we license that AI that, developed, that was developed at the University of Michigan to different headphone companies. The first partner is a company called Master and Dynamic. Uh, you can actually already pre-order those those devices um, through our website, and then very soon, you know, they're they're going to get shipped. Which is crazy to think that this entire journey, you know, has been built out. But in, in the near future, if you buy a pair of headphones and earbuds, chances are they're they're going to have neurotechnology inside, and that neurotechnology comes from our company. So yeah, everybody should go check out the headset on Neurable.com. When will they start shipping, Ramses? We're aiming for April, like March, April timeframe. But you can already start pre-ordering so we know how many to make. 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, the response that we got at CS was amazing, right? To, and, and this yeah. was such a validating moment because it was the first time that we ever really shared it outside of like our own testing. You know, we gave it to reporters. They, they played around with the technology. They could have written anything that they wanted, right? And we ended up winning eight awards uh, for best of CES, best headphones. Tom's Guide said that this is their favorite headphones for, for the year, right? Uh, and so being able to see such great user response was really validating for such a long journey. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I, I can't wait to get one. We ordered one. And um, I'm curious, what should I expect? Like, what what will the product do for me? And how will it kind of enhance my, my life and workflow? Yeah, definitely. I mean, right now we have an entire like 18 month product plan with, with this technology. Um, at first it's going to be for monitoring your focus to prevent burnout. What's really interesting is when people feel tired, it's way past the point that they should have taken a break. Uh, taking a break is kind of like, dehydration. If, if you feel dehydrated, you should have already drank water. You should be drinking water throughout the day. Uh, and so our technology is able to detect that, identify when you need to take a break, uh, and then give you other recommendations like how to improve your, your focus lengths. Uh, as, as our ability to focus keeps continues to get shorter and shorter, our technology helps you recover some of that. Uh, and then on top of that, it will give you suggestions on what time of day is the best time for you to do specific type of works, maybe deep focus versus just answering emails. That's what's coming on the original launch product, but through software updates, we'll be adding more capabilities in, in the next 18 months, such as being able to switch music tracks using hands-free voice-free controls, which is gonna be really exciting. Um, having customized playlists that help you focus or, or achieve a certain state or mood. But essentially, it's like an Apple Watch, but for your brain, right? It's an Apple Watch for the most important organ that we're not currently tracking. I love uh, Apple Watch for the brain is a pretty good, pretty good heuristic. What, what have you noticed, <laughs> I'm curious, in using the product yourself about your focus, maybe that you, that you didn't expect? Yeah, I mean, I suffer from ADHD. It's something that's, that's been a, a big issue since I was a, a, a young kid. And... And what I've noticed is that I've just used a lot less medication recently in my life. You know, um, one of the biggest challenges that I have is, for example, reading a book, right? The, the biggest issue that I have is I'll start reading the page of a book and after the first paragraph, I'll get distracted. And then like my eyes will reach the bottom of the book and then I'll be like, wait a minute, you know, what was I doing again? Like, you know, oh, like, I know the feeling and, and I totally captured none of that, right? And so we have this cool yeah. system. It's not going to roll out at launch, but it's very shortly after. But essentially, when you start to read or do a task that you're focused on and you get distracted, it'll play a small audible tone. Um, and so when I'm reading that book and I hit that paragraph, it's like, oh, wait, I'm distracted right now. And then I'm able to get back into reading it. Uh, instead of figuring out that I got distracted at the end of the page, I figured out as soon as I get distracted. And so now I'm able to read without you know, too much... Uh, issues, you know, um, I'm able to know which days I need to take medication versus not. And these are things that I'm just self exploring, uh, but have added a lot of value for me personally. And, and it's amazing to see what other people are identifying. There's a person that used to drink coffee in the mornings. And then one day he skipped it and he saw his focus didn't change. But in the afternoons, he, that's when he was burnt out, even when he drank coffee. And so now he started drinking coffee in the afternoons. And it turns out that he's able to get two really good productivity sessions in the day instead of just one where he was overburning himself out in the morning versus now having more balance, you know, productivity throughout the day. So there's so many cool things like that, that we're seeing. Yeah, that pro or the, uh, that behavioral change is super interesting. It's something I wanted to dig into where I'm, I'm wondering if, as you think about that book example, right, getting the tone, notifying you that you're sort of losing focus. Do you think it'll retrain in some ways how we focus, how we think, just how our brain works? I think so. And, and just sharing this from my own personal experience, not necessarily from the book side of things, but there's this demo that we have where you can essentially focus on a task and you'll see a, a line go up. And then when you distract yourself, it'll go down. Just getting so many cycles of doing that, mainly because I'm pitching to investors and showing people the technology. Like I now know what it feels like to be in deep focus, right? And so whenever I'm 
working on slides or I'm working on something else that's new. I've, I know how it feels like to be in focus. And so I can turn that on now more than I ever have before in my life. Uh, and so I think that, you know, there's going to be situations where people are going to get just organically learn more about themselves. Right. And through that learning about yourself, because this technology enables you to learn how your brain feels. It, it's, it's interesting because you can feel sore, right? That's, how, that's your body telling you that you're hurt or you're injured. You need to take a break. It's hard to feel sore in your brain, right? Like that's not a gateway yeah. that's easy to access. And so our technology enables people to do that. And through having that layer of communication, I think that people are going to learn and grow from it so much more than they think. Let's go back to the Apple watch for your brain analogy. And I'm, I'm thinking back to the Apple Watch, kind of when it first came out, you know, had this more limited function set, you know, monitor your heart rate, you know, a few things, right? And then gradually they opened it up to developers and the, the mm -hmm. usefulness of the watch expanded. Is that the same vision that you have for the headset and, and your software broadly? Yeah, exactly. So at first the Apple Watch was for monitoring heart rate and movement, you know, and like closing your circles was about it, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can capture heart arrhythmias, right? You can capture fall detection, right? People can develop apps so that your GPS is with you wherever you go instead of carrying your phone, right? You can make calls off of it. So that's how we see a lot of these hearables is what we call them. So hearing-based wearables evolving toward as well too, right? So with software, we'll be updating the headsets so that they go from tracking your focus to essentially... Uh, longer term helping you control them or tracking your health biometrics. A lot of these AI devices that you see now, for example, like Humane or, or Rabbit, where there's like this intelligent AI that has no screen. Well, you know what? That's just going to be your headphones. You, you know, you're just going to have an AirPod in or a pair of headphones on and you're going to talk to it and you're going to control it using brain activity uh, and it's going to be your wearable device as well too. Uh, so I don't think we need a whole new device or pin to access that. That's actually organically where our wearables are going to go. Uh, and and I, I personally believe it's going to be through your hearable technology because you don't want extra things on your body. You just want to carry your headphones with you because that's also how you do your audio. And then that's your holistic system for, for 90 to 95% of the things you do. I mean, it makes total sense. Your voice, I think, always seems like logically it should be the most natural communication interface we have with machines. Uh, maybe that becomes brainwaves. Maybe that's kind of the future of BCI. But how do you think about those two working together, I guess? If we think about the future of AI and now, you know, smarter, smart assistants, how does maybe understanding what's happening in our brain assist whether we're giving input through voice or maybe other mechanisms? Yeah, I think that they're highly tied together, you know, and, and we're already working on, on ways of combining them, right? Uh, I'll give you one direct example and one indirect example. So you can actually pick up small muscular activities around the ear of a person moving their lips and to the precision where you can get words, right? Um, and it's a very limited dictionary. So it's just a few words, a few commands. But essentially, that information can be used as part of the neural network data of these uh, voice technology systems, because what prevents voice from being used at scale? One is that there's too much interference of everything around you, right? So what if we had an additional layer of data that didn't care about noise around you because it has to do with electrical activity around your brain, right, around your head? Uh, so it'll help augment those systems. On top of that, your brain actually has responses whenever you hear something that's wrong. So for example, if you're asking for a, a you know, you know, this was back a few months ago, but like those little baby Yoda toys were really popular, right? Yeah. So if you were asking for a toy Yoda uh, and it thought you meant the car, the Toyota car, you know, your brain actually recognizes that and it creates a brainwave. Um, we can actually pick that up and say, hey, this was the wrong thing that was selected. Try again. And that can all happen seamlessly. And your, your Amazon Alexa system, for example, could say, oh, I think I got it wrong. Did you actually mean X? And now, you know, you don't have to interrupt the system or rush over there and be like, no, no, don't order me a car, right? Like, uh, essentially, it's like a seamless experience of, of it understanding when it got it wrong and self-correcting. 
that's a pretty killer use case. I mean, I, I don't, I feel like I haven't heard anybody sort of talking about that, but that's super important when we think about, I mean, the value, the way we judge these AIs is whether or not they seem to give answers that are useful to us <laughs> and getting that feedback immediately and not having to say no and then correct it is a big step function improvement. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, uh, and yeah, and, and actually there's a great presentation that I did uh, and I can send it to you after this call, uh, but essentially it was with Hartman ventures and and I and I describe some of these different ways how we use voice technology with brain data to self correct or self you know navigate these situations because that's really the future right now what we're missing is a is a seamless feedback system that isn't you talking again um, and and that's really going to help a lot of these uh, technologies out that we work with that makes total sense who do you, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Who do you think, I mean, of these voice assistant companies, right? We've got the big three, Apple, uh, Amazon with Alexa, Google with Assistant. Who do you think might be the first one, if you had to bet on it, that would incorporate uh, brain data? Oof, man, you are putting me on the spot, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I don't think I can say, I can't respond to it without breaking an NDA. So, you know, okay. like... Uh, I'll, I'll probably just say that these companies are working on this technology and we already have partners with some of the, the best companies in the world to roll out products with them in the next few years. Um, so it's not a far-fetched concept. You know, it's just a matter of, of getting there. So that's my way of dodging the question. Yeah, well done. Well done. Good news <laughs> for consumers, though. We're going to get it sometime, hopefully soon. Um, for sure. We, we've talked about, you know, BCI as sort of this layer that can enhance interface in many different ways, um, maybe somewhat as as even an enhancer for performance as well. How do you? I mean, how do you just think about BCI as a as a category? Like, is it an interface? Is it an enhancing technology for humans? Is it something else? You know, how do you frame that? I think the best way is I had a VC one time ask me like, why don't you have a a a TAM slide, you know, a total addressable market slide in your deck. And I responded by saying like neurotech, neurotechnology is kind of like saying, what is the total addressable market of software, right? Like you use software for video games, for smart water bottles, right? For mm -hmm. sleep eight uses it for your sleep, right? Like there's just such an infinite number of applications, right? Neurotechnology is the same way. You can use it for, for example, we're working with DOD for, fatigue prevention of accidents that costs $3 billion yearly, right? Uh, there's truck drivers and, and preventing accidents there. There's blast exposures, TBI detection. There's focus algorithms for, for consumers, right? It's just such a large pool. And so our goal is how do we create a reliable enough brain computer interface in an everyday form factor to empower others to build out some of the solutions. Some of them we're going to do, but really the main value here is how do we create such an easy to build system up uh, system so that others can build because there's just way too much to create here, right? It's like trying to own all of software. It's actually mm -hmm. better just to say like, we're going to make the best software tool and have, and, and just make sure we get a little bit of a cut from everything people make. Yeah. That's what neurable AI is all about. That's what will power the headphones. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering too, since you've been using, you know, AI machine learning techniques, I mean, for, for years now to work on this problem. Has anything meaningfully changed for you, I guess, in terms of the approaches that you've used from a machine intelligence standpoint to process this signal, like in this era of, you know, the golden LLM sort of AI era, or are you still using, you know, a lot of the same approaches that you used before? It's a little bit of a mixture of both. You know, uh, we, to be honest, the system that I've first developed in 2011 and, and started spinning out in 2015, 16 when we met, um, is completely different now than what it was then. The team has just done such an incredible job. I take like zero credit for where we're at right now. They've, they've done a thousand times better than I could even possibly imagine. Um, so like because of that reason, we're using a lot more of the newer techniques that are out and, and the fact that chips can now do neural processing a lot better. Like we, we leverage that type of, uh, you know, advancement as well too. There are a few things that have stayed, um, from those early days, but honestly, like this entire 
you know, burst that's happening in AI is, is only helping us achieve where we're going too faster. You know, we probably needed more expensive hardware in the past. That's why we had large mm -hmm. PCs back when we, in 2000, I think it was 19 when we, you know, caught up with our VR system. I don't know if you remember that system, yeah. but we needed, yeah. we needed yeah, giant PCs PC. to process our models. Yeah. Right. So I had to carry these giant PCs everywhere, but then I went to go demo, right? Now we don't have to do that. So there's, there's just so many advancements happening that are, enabling this timing to be a really solid timing for this type of technology. Yeah, it's, it's benefiting everybody. One, one other question I had, if you think about BCI more broadly, uh, people have heard probably a lot about technology like Neuralink, you know, highly invasive approaches to BCI, but it sounds like you've been able to achieve pretty profound things, obviously with no invasive surgery. So how do you think about, I guess, the field in the context of what's possible just using, you know, a software-based approach, non-invasive approach like Neurable versus stuff like a Neuralink or even a Paradromics, which is another portfolio company of ours? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think both are important. You know, mm -hmm. um, I love what Neuralink and Paradromics are doing. I think that they're very different is how I see them. You know, for example, one is... Actually, I'll give this example, like a, a hip replacement. A hip replacement is probably the most successful invasive surgery ever. <laughs> but you would never get a hip replacement unless you needed one, right? Even if, you're, even if a hip replacement made it so that your hips were a thousand times better than they are now, you probably still wouldn't get one, right? And that's going to be un the unfortunate truth for a lot of these invasive systems, right? For people with ALS, they're going to want to use invasive system maybe somebody who needs to control a prosthetic device may consider one right uh, but it's going to be a very long time before these invasive systems become something that becomes standard right just because they're opening your yeah. body right but when it comes to non-invasive there's this entire ocean of applications that we have trapped in laboratories that are great solutions for problems that exist now and you would buy an Apple watch, right? You would buy a pair of smart shoes, for example, or AirPods. Um, and now if those gave you the ability to, for example, an Apple watch now can track Parkinson's, right? It can be used for heart arrhythmias, right? And so you don't need an invasive heart sensor to now track heart arrhythmias, right? To tell you that you might need some sort of cardiac attention earlier, right? Um, and so those are all things that essentially I see for the brain. There's so many incredibly low hanging fruits that we can give access to that don't require surgery. And they're just two different classes of brain computer interfaces. So it seems like maybe if we fast forward, I don't know, five, 10 years out, maybe the most advanced applications, the most advanced things that people are trying to do, whether that's maybe restore hearing or motion to a limb or something like that, maybe that's where you go for the full invasive approach, but maybe a lot of the things that we think we might need invasive technologies for, maybe we don't, maybe we can get it done with something like Neurable. Yeah. And, and some of these things, you may not even need to go all the way to invasive. For example, restoring hearing, right? Maybe for the most, you know, individuals who have the most hearing loss, potentially, right? But for people who have moderate hearing loss, maybe their AirPods or their hearing aids just take brain data in and know how to change the tuning a little bit, right? Um, which is something that you can do with current neurotechnology systems. Uh, and that's actually something that we have in our roadmap as well too, which is like intelligent audio tuning or intelligent noise cancellation based off of hearing loss or what the person's attending to, right? And so for, for an individual who has complete hearing loss, you probably do need some sort of neural surgery. But somebody who, you know, the 99% of people who can hear well and... Uh, but are just aging naturally, then we have a technology that doesn't require surgery that just grows with them, transitions with them. Um, music adapts without them even knowing that they're getting, you know, still being able to hear the same music the way they heard it 10 years ago. I feel like we're learning so many different cool use cases for your technology. We just heard about uh, improving hearing, right, for mild to moderate hearing loss. We heard about error detection and, and correction potentially for like voice assistance. What, as you've experimented with and sort of 
maybe identified other potential use cases for Nurable. What's what's like the coolest one that you're most excited about? Uh, I, I'll give you two actually, uh, because one is like practically speaking, and the other one's just like cool factor. Uh, practically speaking, I really want a smart noise cancellation that that works intelligently. You know, especially now that the new AirPods have that adaptive system where they can hear if you're talking to somebody and they lower the volume. That never works for me. It, it has never worked for me, especially walking around in public when that's on. Like somebody's just yelling across the street and then my music goes down and like I just missed my favorite part, right? It, it just does not work. So to me, it's like imagine having a system where you're, for example, on the plane, you're watching a movie, a flight attendant starts talking to you. We notice that your attention goes from whatever you're listening to right now, which would be the movie, to now this other person, right? So imagine your headphones automatically pause the movie for you. You know, it decreased all the background noise and the noise of the person speaking next to you, but increased the sound of the flight attendant. Like having that type of dynamic, you know, and seamless noise cancellation, I think would just be incredible. Like that, that I can't wait for. And then you see a lot of people walking around with one AirPod in their ear or like with adaptive, all like the time. With, with like, with like, um, what's that other mode that, that they have where it's just the transparency mode. There transparency. You go. Like, yeah. yeah, you see people transparency mode or, or with one AirPod. And the reason for that is because we don't have adaptive ANC, right? We don't have a way to control what we're listening to dynamically. And so being able to enable that, I think is going to be amazing. I can't wait for that. Um, and then a just the cool factor stuff. is, is like just switching a music track by not having to use my yeah. hands. You know, it's like, it's not really that needed. But like it'd be cool to be at the gym lifting a weight, and if I don't like the song, I could just, you know, think or or click in some sort of way to switch the music track. Like that would be really cool. You get that extra rep. That's that's gains. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that is cool. Um, so, all right, let's let's end on this note. As you think about the brain computer interface world going into 2024, what is the most exciting thing that we should all be paying attention to for BCI this year? Uh, this is going to sound like I am uh, I am selling out or something, but like you should definitely pay attention to us. Like we we just introduced this product. It's the first time brain computer interface works seamlessly. New software updates are going to be continuously rolled out. I, I you know it's just it's the first time that we're going to see this technology work like a product and not a science project. To me, that's the most exciting thing that that I know uh, that that's coming to market. Uh, but just to give some love to a few other things, you know, obviously Neuralink is going to keep doing what they're doing. There's going to be, you know, they're going to human trials, which is going to be pretty exciting. Uh, and, you know, you start to, you're seeing patents now for big tech companies for doing in-ear like uh, brain-based sensors. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, this whole industry is starting to, starting to happen. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think it's going to be a hot industry this year. It is. It is. To your point earlier, long time coming. You guys have done such a great job, I think, kind of pioneering the industry. And so everybody should check out the, uh, it's the MW75 Neuro, the headphones mm -hmm. on Neurable.io. We'll put the link in the show notes. But uh, Ramses, thanks for educating us on everything you're building at Neurable. For sure. Thank you, Doug.